the administration then chose to defame me and, more importantly, the FBI by saying that the organization was in disarray, that it was poorly led, that the workforce had lost confidence in its leader. Those were lies, plain and simple. And I am so sorry that the FBI workforce had to hear them. Tall Tyler, I'm so get sorry in here. That get in here quick. Were told uh, uh, yes, Mr. President. I, worked I lost my phone. Have you seen my phone? Make that great organization uh, no. And I say help. I feel like because I did you were going to change the battery for me. There are no oh, yeah. It, it keeps running out of batteries, doesn't it? It does. I don't know how to deal with it. Ivanka says she has one that recharges. Have you heard of this? A battery that recharges? What? That, that's what I said. Crazy. Women, right? T totally. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going to send it from my computer then. You're what? You're what? Yeah. I'm no liar. You're the liar. I'll take a lie detector test on Mori Povich, bitch. Hashtag owned. Um, s sir, I... Double T, I'm tweeting. What happened? It's not sending. How come it's not sending? I, I guess the internet must be running slow, sir. It's, uh... It's certainly not a piece of paper taped to a computer that's turned off, if that's what you were thinking. Good to know. Good be, to know. Yeah. Tyler? Uh-huh? What's in your pocket? N nothing, sir. That's, uh, my p penis. TIE Fighter, I know what a pocket penis looks like, and that's no pocket penis. That's my phone. No, sir, no, it's it's not, it's it's not, er, it's not. Get Tyler, get Mr. Me, get me Tyler. Mr. President, please. Grab my guy, grab my guy. Benny Yahoo taught me this. Grab my guy, grab Jesus, my guy. Jesus, you're so sweaty. Grab my guy, grab my guy. Got yeah, it. Sir, please. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you think that was treason. Just wait till I execute you for telling Jimmy. Said, I, I hate you. Don't lash out, Tyler. Don't lash out. Not now. Not in front of America. Grab my guy. Grab my guy. <laughs> it's Monday. It's June 12th. And the word of the day is hubris, which means excessive pride or self-confidence. Used in a sentence, Theresa May is now learning that hubris can be every bit as unpleasant as a jubris. <laughs> I feel like it's like uh, less circumcision and more castration, though. I mean, she did just lose two of the nuts closest to her. <laughs> but she gained a whole bucket of Irish ones. Yeah, good point. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's far center, we are the Skeptocrats. On episode 52... We release the Trump tapes before Trump gets to them. We'll stare <laughs> jaw agape at the smoldering dystopian comic tragedy that is the global political landscape some more. And Michael Marshall will be here to talk about the UK's latest Funkadelic elections. But first, the end of the intro music. For listeners like myself, who don't follow the news very closely... Because, you know, it's boring and nothing important is happening in the world. <laughs> I should mention that a couple months ago, a rather minor public official lost his job. And then this week, there was the standard Senate hearing about that job losing to make sure the president didn't commit treason during everything that happened. All pretty standard stuff. And here to help me break it all down are two gentlemen as used to watching terrible things as an old German person, no illusions, <laughs> and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, welcome back from the break. Did you, as I wrote in your yearbooks, have a nice summer? I I still feel like a yearbook for our show was a waste of money. I want to put that on record one more time. I liked it. I was in all the clubs. Yeah. <laughs> Noted and rejected. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty here, because, of course, formula is foundation. Eli, how bad was this hearing? Well... If you didn't commit treason and you understand that I can't talk about that here is code for yes, you <laughs> will love this hearing. <laughs> All right. And speaking of which, Eli, just a quick question unrelated. Have you had sex with a moose? No, I have not, Heath. Okay. Okay. And Noah, have you ever had sex with an albatross? No, sure haven't. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, question for both of you. 
Have either of you had sex with a goat before? Uh, Can't talk session. about that here. I, uh, I need would to, to answer that. Provide, I, it's hard to because there's an investigation session. ongoing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Now, I should start out with an apology up front. Because of our live gam record this weekend, Noah and I haven't had time to listen to the whole testimony just yet. But lucky for us, the committee was kind enough to release his opening statement in advance. So we can comment on that part. So it basically broke into three parts. Part one, remember when I, James Comey, got surprise fired by the President of the United States? I mean, it wasn't the most tasteless use of a singing telegram, but it was up there. I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? For what it's worth, I think the Botswana ambassador was just being a dick. I think it was the most tasteless use of a singing telegram. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, part two, the president is a big fat liar. That was a long part. <laughs> it's an important okay, part. actual quote. Those were lies, plain and simple. Yep. <laughs> and I, James Comey, am so sorry that the FBI workforce had to hear them. And I am so sorry the American people were told them. End quote. <laughs> no, let me take a second to apologize for how much of a piece of shit Trump is. <laughs> Well, yeah, and in retrospect, might have been a mistake to expend all the trust capital pretending the photons bouncing off your inaugural crowd were part of a liberal conspiracy. Who'd have thunk? <laughs> Big spectrum. Yeah. Big light spectrum was in on that. And uh, part three, don't worry, everyone at the FBI. I love you, and I always will. Sure hope nobody leaks enough to put this orange piece of shit in prison. Yeah, little context for those who don't know. Whatever you think of James Comey, and there are a lot of things to think, according to pretty much all the sources, he was beloved at the FBI, right? He was the guy who called you on your cell phone when you had a baby. He remembered your names and your birthdays and shit. And and there have been several reports of, uh, of the FBI at this point that pretty much everyone left in the organization is livid about his firing. So yeah, quite a stirring goodbye. <laughs> He just leans forward, fuck him hard, show him who the spies are. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, emails. Um, yeah, no, there was a... Uh, she asked yeah. me to call it a wow. Miss Jess, Miss Session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, obviously, there's a lot more to say about Comey's testimony, but with so much going on in the world, we figured we didn't have time to get into every little nuance of the he said, he said. Instead, we figured we'd clear up the controversy once and for all, so... After a clever plot that involved a pogo stick, a Barney the Dinosaur costume, and temporarily convincing Noah he had inoperable liver cancer, he doesn't, we at the Skeptocrat were actually able to obtain the tapes Trump secretly made of his interactions with James Comey. And to clear the air, we'd like to play a few of the excerpts for you now. James, come on in. Mr. President. Sit down. Let's have a little nosh. Tyler, you can go. Uh, sir, are you eating a alone with Director Comey? Yep, just me and him. I, I don't think that that would be a very good... Don't um, worry, it's going to be fine. I I'm going to go eat more Tums. Always oh, eating Tums, that guy. Don't understand it. Hmm, yeah, I see. I but, get it. What are you, what are you doing? Oh, oh, this? I'm, I'm just writing down literally everything that happens. Seems normal. So look, mm -hmm. about your job, I hope you'll stay. Yep, yep, planning on staying. Good. Good. I don't want anyone to fire you, James. Jim. Can I call you Jim? No. Great. Jimmy, I would hate Still, for no. anyone okay. to fire you. And that's why I need loyalty, Jimmy. Um, the FBI is a bipartisan law enforcement agency. Loyalty is the absolute opposite of what you should be asking me for. That's a weird thing you, you what? do. Sorry, I was tweeting. I, I mean, I'll always be honest with you. Perfect. Honest loyalty. Wait, d did this actually happen? Yeah, that last part is like word for word. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Okay, everyone out of the room. But what needs to stay? Rules the eternal general. Yeah, you especially, Jeff. Tyler, what's up? Uh, sorry, Mr. President, just for clarity, you are shooing everyone else out of the room so you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the director of the FBI. Yep, just a little chat. Mind-blowing. Yeah, please, 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 please don't do that. It'll be fine. You guys are worried too much. So, Jimmy. James. J-Dog. J-Unit. No. Nope. Catch this ball. Um, alright. I, I caught it. You see that hoop over there? 
the the one you seem to have written the word justice on? Yeah. Go ahead. Take a shot. Uh okay. Abstracted. Oh, yeah. I see what you did there. It's clever. Please let Mike Flynn get away with treason. <laughs> Chisel for Rizzo, come on in. I refuse to leave the room. I would rather die. So I want to talk about Mike Flynn again. Oh, Jesus. I'll be in the other room. Okay, uh, what do you want, Mr. President? So, James, you still pursuing that thing? D- my, my job? Yeah, st- still doing my job. Jimmy, it's Thank like you. a cloud. Jesus. Like a big black cloud following me around all day, all night. A big, sure. dark, scary cloud. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't it be great, yeah. James? Wouldn't it be great if someone could make that cloud go away? I I can imagine the pleasure of, of that experience, sir, theoretically. You get it. Wink. Nope. Not wink. You are my sunshine. My <laughs> only sunshine. <laughs> oh, I've been looking forward to you singing that in your Trump voice all fucking day, dude. It's been, this was kept me going today. It's been a long one. <laughs> As you know, the United States wasn't the only English-speaking country that spent 2016 fucking up an election in such a way as to maximally embarrass our generations. A few months before we decided to elect the guy who most closely matched Pepe the Frog in both looks and political ideology, our buddies across the pond fired what should have been a warning shot across our bow when they decided to go back to the pre-1945 days of European peace and prosperity. Well, and what we can only hope is something of a preview of our next national election, the Brits went to the back to the polls last Thursday and started the long process of saying fuck all that noise. And to learn more about that, we went and found ourselves an actual British person. Michael Marshall is a full-time skeptical activist and the co-founder of Merseyside Skeptics. He's the host of the Be Reasonable podcast and the co-host of the Skeptics with a K podcast. And when he's not podcasting, which is, let's face it, most of the time, he's the project director of the Good Thinking Society, where he spends his days fighting against the powers of British bullshit. Marsh, welcome to the Skeptocrat. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here, North. Thanks for having us, have me on at this time of, uh, let's say, unsteady uh, politics <laughs> yeah, here in the UK. No it's shit. been an interesting few days. Dystopian hellscape from our end of the pond. But yeah, yeah, no, maybe there's a light at the end of this tunnel. All right, so you guys had an election on Thursday. Uh, who is your president now? Okay, what time are we recording this and what time is this going out? Because I don't know that the answer will be the same between those two. It's currently still Theresa May, um, but I don't think we've ever had a leader so clearly not uh, not here for the, the long run. Uh, it, it could be anyone within the next couple of days. God knows what's going to happen here. It's just an incredible time. All right. So like, I, I want to just to stave off the emails. It was a joke. I said, President, I know they have they don't have a, it was that was a joke. Don't email me. Um, but seriously, I, I know that a lot of our listeners are only vaguely aware of even, uh, like how a parliamentary system even works. So if you don't mind, could you give us sort of like the uh, schoolhouse rocks overview of, of how your elections actually shape up? Yeah, sure. No problem. Because to be honest, I think an awful lot of people in Britain have really only peripheral awareness <laughs> of how our parliament works. And that's a big reason for why things went quite so south last year and have been so uh, crazy this year. Um, so basically, I mean, you guys, I think you vote for a president, don't you? you actually, you, when you cast your vote, you vote for Hillary or Trump. Mm. Uh, whereas here in the UK, we don't. We vote for our local candidate from one of the parties that are running. Uh, and then there is 650 seats in parliament, uh, which the people you vote for, then take up. And whichever party gets the most MPs into Parliament, uh, they go on to form the government and their leader of the leader of that party typically goes on to be the prime minister. And technically, they've got to go to the Queen to get her to sign off on this and go, yeah, this makes sense. But what's really clear is that's very much a formality, because if there was any sense check going on in that stage, none of the last couple of years would be happening. If, if Liz could do anything other than smile and nod, and if she had any formal power other than looking after the swans, uh, I don't think uh, we'd be in the state that we're in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but but usually usually it's really straightforward because there's 650 seats, which means you just need to get one more than half to be the major party. So you get 326 seats. 
if you get more than three two six, you are the biggest party. It's a it's a you know a, a nice simple decision to declare you the the leading party and therefore your uh, your leader prime minister. Um, but and last time around, the Conservative Party or the Tories uh, under David Cameron got three hundred and thirty one seats. So they were like five more than uh, six more than half, five more than they needed. So they had a very very slim majority, but a majority nonetheless. And that's kind of where we were up until Thursday morning when everything went crazy. Yeah, so l- let's just be clear here. How surprising were these results? It, 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 this was astonishing. This was genuinely astonishing because the whole point of this election uh, was that Theresa May was so far ahead of, uh, of her opponent, Jeremy Corbyn, of the Labour Party, that this was easy for her. And this is important for her to call this election to a degree because so far she hadn't won an election. Um, she hadn't even been elected to lead her party. Because when David Cameron left after the whole Brexit mistake, um, they had a uh, they normally have a, an election from Tory party MPs who decide who they want to lead. But when they ran that election, every other candidate took each other out in this kind of act of self-destruction as they were trying to undermine each other. And she was the last one left. She kind of Steve Buscemi from Reservoir Dogs did into <laughs> number 10. She was just the last one still standing, which means she hadn't won an election. Her vision for, for Brexit in particular hadn't been kind of signed off by the uh, by the UK, um, you know, the UK uh, majority, the UK, the UK populace. So she thought, well, I'm so far ahead. I can now play this kind of uh, election card now, because uh, if you left it any later, the fuck up that Brexit is would dawn on a lot more people and her lead would start to shrink as things started to look shitter. So this was like meant to be the sweet spot. Declare the election now, walk it while you're so far ahead, and then you've got five years to try and deal with whatever was going on. And that's what everyone was expecting. Um, so to say that she was she was anticipating getting at least an additional 60 seats that's what a lot of the polls of people who are kind of in the know were saying she's going to get at least more 60 more seats a majority of at least 70 maybe even 100 seats so the fact that she didn't even gain a single seat and she said i need this to, to get more uh more of a majority so that uh my plan for brexit can go smoother so this is important this will give me a mandate to carry on if i get more seats and she got fewer seats, fewer to a point where she actually lost the majority. Uh, so the, the thing about this is, I mean, Labour didn't win this election. They got 262 seats. Uh, she got 318 seats. Um, but compared to what it was meant to be, that's not a bad showing from, from Labour. Uh, this isn't the best outcome of the election. But for a whole host of reasons, it is objectively the funniest outcome of this election. <laughs> there is no way this could have been more funny. It's incredible. Well, okay, but so now they, they've lost their majority, but there are strong indicators that they're still going to be able to form a, a government with the fellows that put the DUP in stand up guys, the, uh, the DUP. <laughs> so uh, w- what can you tell us about these fine progressive individuals? Yeah, well, well, basically, not a huge amount, largely because other than the people who pay a lot of attention to Northern Ireland, which by and large is people in Northern Ireland, the majority of the country, I think, have never heard of the DUP. This is such a fringe party in terms of the the whole of the mainstream UK politics. They've got like 10 MPs now. They had fewer. Uh, They are the Democratic Unionist Party who believe that Northern Ireland should stay part of the UK. Um, But more importantly, they are... Uh, committed homophobes, they are creationists, they are religious fundamentalists um, who, you know, w- won't, uh, won't campaign on a Sunday, for example, because that's God's day. Um, <laughs> they've done some astonishing things in the past. So you've got, you know, Giant's Causeway in Ireland, that really famous kind of geological structure, a naturally occurring geological structure that kind of looks like kind of big steps going out into the sea. Mm. Um, they tried to block the building of a museum explaining how that uh, came about because it didn't give a creationist view of how that came about. This, this is the government that, that is, this is who is now propping up the government. Um, there's one DUP MP called Sammy Wilson, who's now, he's still serving, has been since 1994. Or, well, he was in politics in 1994. And in 1994, he actually, actually called for the ethnic cleansing of Catholics from Northern Ireland. Oh. And he's now someone that Theresa May is going to rely on for votes. Jesus. It's just astonishing. And the great thing about this is Theresa May, you know, after uh, the day after the election, her way of coping with this was basically to pretend it never happened. She gave a speech the morning after the election and she never mentioned the election once in really? the speech. 
She just didn't mention it. <laughs> she actually ended her speech by saying, now, let's get back to work. Oh, was there something, um, some big thing in the news? I haven't heard. I've been on, I was just, I was off Twitter. I didn't, I, yeah, wow. Uh, it's, it's just astonishing. There's just, the things that happened during this election are just incredibly funny. You know, um, for one thing, you know, we, we don't do the kind of election campaigns that you do in America where you spend, what is it, about three and a half years uh, on the campaign three, trail. 3.94, uh, yeah, is the actual, yeah. Yeah. We, we get two months. We dissolve our government, so there is no government for two months. And that's when people do their campaigning. We've got kind of limited funding and uh, limited uh, campaign spend, stuff like that. So some of the stuff happened in the last eight weeks. Every single place that May visited at all in her campaigning voted against her in the election. Oh, There's wow. not one place she appeared that ended up actually voting for her. <laughs> um, you know, the fact that she she called this to increase her, her uh, majority and she lost so many seats, she lost control of government. It's kind of the equivalent of demanding an interview for a job you've already got and then coming away from that interview with a demotion and a salary cut. It's just <laughs> astonishingly bad planning. Well, well, now, to be fair to her, though, she has noticed that the deck chairs on the Titanic are in massive disarray. So she's doing something about that, right? She is. Yeah, she, she's shuffling her cabinet around. She's putting people in new position, which, when you think about it, is a bit fucking rich because she's just gone through this election, which she said would shore up her uh, her mandate, would shore up her credibility. And her credibility has been decimated. And now she's the one firing people from her cabinet. She's the one sort of taking their jobs away and putting other people in place. So. I can't imagine this lasting. It's, it's re- and the thing is, this is the Tory party, and they specialize in stabbing each other in the back in a, 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 a fight to the top of the greasy pole. These are the ones who will take their, the kneecaps off their best friend in the party if it means they'll get an extra few inches up that pole. So this is now going to be a ferocious fight amongst the most kind of cynical political operators in the country to get in her seat. And there is no way Theresa May can maintain it. There's no way she can hold it. It's just astonishing. Okay, so if you have put your nickel down, you say she is not long in the job. Is there anybody that you would maybe make a prediction winds up there? Well, again, it depends on what day we're talking. I mean, there's, there's talk that uh, Boris Johnson is going to take over, but Boris, John- Boris Johnson himself is hugely mired in scandal. And you can see him already playing to take over. There was uh, a leak, apparently, of one of his WhatsApp messages to uh, in a WhatsApp thread of Tory MPs. And this embarrassing leak of what he's been saying, uh, when you read what it says, it's all the reasons why we should stand behind Theresa May. This is this, this message saying, actually, guys, we need to give her our full support for these eight reasons. And I think the ninth reason which was missed off the screenshot was could someone please leak this one to the press uh, as soon as they've done reading this because it's so clearly manufactured to uh, to try and put him in a good light but i think got boris has had so much kind of uh, sleaze and scandal behind him that i don't think many people will get on board with him you had Amber Rudd, who's the current Home Secretary, who would have looked like she was in a, in a good position to, uh, to take over from Mayor, except in her constituency, she got uh, her, her massive majority of more than 10,000 votes in her favour was cut to just 300. And it took three recounts and wasn't declared until like six or seven in the morning because it was that close. And she's basically the number three politician in government right now. And she was almost gone to the tune of uh, just 300 uh, votes in it. So it's really hard to see who's going to take over. I mean, you've got Ruth Davidson, who's pretty charismatic, uh, in uh, she's leader of the the Scottish uh, Tory MPs, the the Tory MSPs, uh, members of parliament for the Scottish Parliament, and they the Tory MSPs have basically saved the Tory Party because they've gained a lot from the the Scottish kind of National Party up there. But uh, Ruth Davidson is a very open and probably the most prominent LGBT Tory politician. And so they are now being propped up by the DUP, yep. who believes that homosexuality is a, a sin to point where they've said, I am pretty repulsed by homosexuality and lesbianism. This is the government that is now propping up. Well, this is the, the party that's propping up Ruth Davidson. And Ruth Davidson, you know, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, tweeted out a link to a, a speech she gave at a Belfast Pride event in support for same sex marriage as a Protestant about to marry a Catholic <laughs> in a gay marriage. So uh-huh. there's. There's so much shade in that tweet, it's practically black. That's how much shade she's throwing at the government for getting to bed with the DUP. It's it's just chaos. The DUP thing is genuinely remarkable. Well, yeah, can you, can you speak a little to the, how that kind of fucks up May's campaign rhetoric? 
Yeah, well, I mean, every bit of her campaign rhetoric is kind of fucked up. So if you look at every soundbite that May relied on in this campaign, she said that hers would be the strong and stable government. And it's a strong and stable government that's now looking basically for its third leader in the space of 12 months. This is just complete you know, uh, chaos. And she said that the uh, that if Labour did well, they'd end up going into uh, going into bed with a couple of the other parties, and it would be a coalition of chaos. Is the way she described what would happen if huh. Labour did well. She's and now she's in bed with the DUP, and she called uh, Corbyn a terrorist sympathizer because he had historic links, apparently, to the uh, Irish Rep- Republican Army, the IRA. But the DUP are the other side of that terrorism, yeah, basically. They're supporting the other side. So she's literally getting into bed right now with ter- uh, terrorist sympathizers. And it, it's, be- it's worth pointing out the DUP aren't even in government in Northern Ireland right now. Because Northern Ireland doesn't have a government because the government that they did have, which was the DUP, was embroiled in a scandal that, that actually dissolved the Northern Irish government. So there's no – the DUP aren't in government in Northern Ireland, but technically will almost be in government in uh, mainland UK. And this fucks up the Good Friday Agreement, which is the one that was aimed to you know, secure peace in, in uh, Northern Ireland and has kept peace for 20 years or so now. But a, a fundamental part of that is that the government have to remain neutral in negotiations between the two sides in Ireland. Oh. But one of those sides, the DUP, and now they're basically in government in the UK. <laughs> so they're not in government in Northern Ireland. They are in the UK when they're not allowed to technically be involved in governing Northern Ireland. It's astonishing. This, it just seems like there are – like every thread we could pull on this has endless threads to pull. Um, so, yeah, okay. So- every one of them gets funnier as well. That's the thing. Every one of them gets funnier looking at what Theresa May has done in this whole this, – this self-inflicted wound. Yeah, that, that is – just fucking phenomenal from just a, a schadenfreude perspective um okay so let's let's spin another scenario of chaos uh because it, everything you know seems to indicate that they are going to make a deal with the dup dup is like kind of playing hardball like for you know whatever for imaging um yeah but- well I mean, bear in mind that the, the tories announced they'd had a deal with the dup mm-hmm. and then afterwards they had to announce that oh we haven't struck a deal we just released the wrong press release by mistake oh jesus so they had to kind of so this is a, this is a uh, all the way through the campaigning. Theresa May would announce a policy from the manifesto, and then immediately have to U-turn on it because it was so viciously unpopular. And now, even now that they're talking about the deal with the DUP, they've basically had to U-turn on announcing the deal with the DUP because they've gone ahead of themselves. It's it's inc- it's incredible. Okay, so what what would happen like theoretically if they were unable to strike a deal with the DUP? Basically, no one really knows. Um, May could try and soldier on with a minority government, um, but that takes a lot of cross-party support because you've got to say that we will be able to work with uh, different parties on these issues. But she is such a toxic personality, and she's like uh, she's insulated herself from any external involvement to such a degree that cross-party support is just impossible and untenable. There's no other leader who's now willing to get in, willing to support Theresa May, not least because her campaign has been so toxic to the other leaders, Colin Corbyn, a terrorist sympathiser, Tim Farron, who's the, the leader of the most uh, liberal, uh, social liberal party here, which is the Lib Dems. Um, she painted him as a homophobe because he's an evangelical Christian. And she said, well, he believes that gay sex is a sin and he wouldn't be drawn on his personal beliefs, but his party's really good on LGBT rights. So he was saying, you know, whatever my own personal beliefs are, this party is the one I'm leading and this is the party position on those things and they're really, really good positions. So that's how she painted Tim Farron. And that was a big, big part of this, uh, this whole campaign. Campaign, and yet she's now in bed with the DUP who are openly hostile to gay people. It's, it, she, she famously wore a T-shirt a little while ago uh, when Cameron refused to wear it, which says this, this is what a feminist looks like. And now she's in bed with the DUP who are actively currently trialing women in Northern Ireland for having had abortions. They are currently on trial for the crime of having had an abortion. And this is the party she's supporting. Honestly, every way you look at this just gets weirder and weirder. God knows what's going to happen. God knows what's going to happen. Labour could try and form a a minority government, but they don't really have the numbers to make that work. We're almost certainly looking at another election, which means we'll have had a general election in 2015, a Brexit referendum in 2016, this one in 2017, probably another election in either 2017 or 2018. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's. It, I gotta say, like, if you were a detached like man from Mars, this would be the most interesting time ever to follow politics. It's. It's. You know, it's terrifying because there's all these real world consequences. But if you take that out, this is a great fucking story. Well, it is, and the thing is, we were expecting such a cat, uh, such a catastrophic result for sensible people. You know, fairly sort of uh, left leaning, fairly kind of liberal type people. We were expecting this to be such a cataclysmic event that 
anything other than that has got its positive side. But watching the complete implosion in, in ways we could never have imagined is, is you know, hugely satisfying. Mm -hmm. Now, OK, so like the way the American media is uh, is painting this and, and largely from what I've seen, the way the British media is painting this is as a referendum on the referendum. Uh, it, w would you say that's accurate from sort of your taking of the temperature of the national temperature? Sort of. I wish it were. I really wish it were. I mean, Theresa May herself, herself said, I'm calling this election based on Brexit, basically. She said, I need a mandate to go into Brexit. So she thought this would, uh, was a, a, a mandate for Brexit, Brexit, but that's when she thought she was going to win it. That's when she assumed she'd walk it. Mm. Uh, she's now walking this back uh, like that never happened. And even you know, a couple of days before the election, she tweeted saying, if I lose just six seats, Jeremy Corbyn will be the one negotiating Brexit as PM. And she lost 13 seats. And she's just <laughs> pretending that never happened. She's pretending she never said that. So, yeah, I'd love to see this as, a, as a, a rejection of Brexit. I think it might in part be a rejection of the extremist hard Brexit that we've seen uh, under May's government. So maybe that's that. But as it happens... Brexit didn't really come up in the campaign that much. And when uh, people have polled voters as they were leaving to say, what were the issues that you voted on? I think for left wing voters, only 8% of them said Brexit was part of their decision making. Really? So uh, the problem is, I think a lot of people have bought the idea that it's happened now, we have to get over it. Uh, and that's a, a massive problem because we're going to see more and more problems with Brexit over the next couple of years. Um, so does this undermine Brexit? Ugh, hard to say. Interestingly, and this again just shows how completely unpredictable this whole fucking uh, situation has been, uh, one of the big issues in it with Brexit is what's going to happen in Northern Ireland, because uh, the Republic of Ireland is in the EU because it's not part of the UK. The no Northern Ireland is in the UK, which will therefore come out of the EU. And you've got this big, long border between the Republic and Northern Ireland, which is already contentious. Once you start saying that you have to impose restrictions on freedom of movement because you know, Ireland is uh, – Republic, Republic of Ireland still EU, Northern Ireland, UK. If you want to get into the UK, you could go fly to Republic of Ireland, get a train across the border and come into the UK without any restrictions to movement. So one of the ways to, to solve that would have to be put a hard border with passport control. But there's like 300 access points between the two islands. So either you close those off and build basically an Israeli-style wall <laughs> or, a, or, sorry, an American-style yeah, well, wall yeah, right, right. <laughs> along the length. Um, or you can't really have freedom. Of, you can't really restrict freedom of movement, which is one of the central things that the Brexit, that a hard Brexit is trying to impose, that a restriction of freedom of movement so we can control immigration, the immigration that isn't a problem for us is actually really beneficial to us. So ironically, bringing the DUP into things, the DUP will not want a hard wall or border controls because you won't want to have to show your – one of the solutions will be you have to show your passport when coming from Northern Ireland to the UK or into mainland UK, but they won't want that, obviously, because they are the UK as far as they're concerned they want to be fully part of the uk so ironically partnering with the dup might mean the island situation becomes way more visible which might mean a death to the idea of restrictions on freedom of movement which might mean a death to hard brexit so the crazy people <laughs> that are in just a proper mayor's hard brexit government might accidentally be the ones who end up stopping it it's it's so topsy-turvy everything about this election is topsy-turvy you know the reason that may have to get into bed with the dup is because largely a youth vote who are largely very socially progressive, very liberal, have risen, removed her power, and she's rewarding that or she's countering that by going to an even more extremist right wing group to set themselves up. So this swell of youth voters who are voting with a, a positive, hopeful, uh, open, uh, accepting and tolerant view of the world may have accidentally and uh, essentially uh, brought about a government that is far more hardline and right wing. Everything about this is fucked. Wow. Awesome. Well, it's going to be really fascinating to uh, to keep track of over the coming weeks. Uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on and helping us get our heads around all of it. Of course, if our listeners would like to hear more from Marsh, we'll have links to his podcast on the show notes, as well as links to more info about the Good Thinking Society and the Mercy Side Skeptics. Uh, anything else you want to plug while I've got you here, man? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The tickets for QED are currently on sale, and uh, you've been to QED. You know it's an all right, uh, all right time. Uh, I'm one of the co-organizers co of it, and um, I think people should uh, come along. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun weekend. I think the biggest skeptical conference probably in the world now, certainly in Europe, and uh, that's on the 14th and 15th of October in Manchester. And you can find details of all of that on at uh, QEDcon.org. And I'm sure you guys will just randomly mention it in conversation as you have been over the last couple of months anyway. So uh, yeah, looking to see loads of uh, listeners from uh, from your coterie of shows there, hopefully. 
Awesome. Well, I, I will say, you know, I, I'm something of an expert on skeptic conferences. Uh, QED is the best organized conference in the game. It is like I, 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 I would go to it four times a year if I could. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, couldn't endorse it more. Uh, all right. Well, thanks again for your time, man. Anytime at all. If anything else crazy happens in the UK, you know where I am. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And that's going to do it for episode 52. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Of course, thanks to Michael Marshall. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Susan, Richard, Murphy, Larry, Rhonda the Dork, Dennis, Ray, Ashley, Casey, Kevin, Stink Vomit, Lisa, Ryan, Richard, Simon, and the future Mrs. Enright, whose lovely genitals would scoop across the Neapolitan ice cream if their genitals were scooping Neapolitan ice cream. But they probably wouldn't because there's so many other worthy flavors that are way better. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, Check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist and God Awful Movies, available on iTunes, Stitcher, or the Deep Web. And don't forget about Citation Needed. Check that one out as well. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penist. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Drafts on Mars. He is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with his permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide, or by Googling the only band called Evil Drafts on Mars. Until next time... Catchphrase sign off. Oh, if the poor all die, everyone will be That's rich. That's Eli's catchphrase. Yeah. yeah, they don't become through in the episode so I, I just, now I've just put them in for us because <laughs> I'm being censored the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC copyright 2017 all rights reserved